morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, Ellen. Hello, kids. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Weird visual. Like I have something on the lens almost, right? And we can't figure yeah. it out. Broadcasting live from hell. <laughs> Need that echo. Uh, for people listening at home, uh, I am very, 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 very red on screen for some reason. Yeah, and it, it looks like there's a haze filter of some type. I don't know what's going on. We already yeah. cleaned the lens, so it's not that. So I, I, I have no know. idea. As I was, I used this last night, and I put the computer on sleep, and I came back. So there's n- <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe the computer one. has sleep in its eyes. I don't know. Ah, ba <laughs> but yeah weird but anyway yeah um it's not easy being pink um so yes yeah, it's, it's it's a little weird so uh, i apologize nope not sunburnt at all not sunburnt it's just i mean as you can tell like the the the, the hue of pink is over absolutely everything like even the logo mm-hmm. right yeah. you can see here so it's no it's no, no, I, I'm feeling good, but thank you for the concern. <laughs> well, hello, kids and cubs, and welcome to the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. And you have uh, Nishataka saying, uh, with Magnum P.I. stash. And it's like, yeah, I'm like hearing the music in my head. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, I'm your host, Eager Beaver Pronouns, he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. Uh, a big thank you goes to our podcasts, founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfee Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. It's our Victoria Day special episode because, you know, we don't take the day off. You get us, mm. statutory holiday or not. So... Before we dive in, let's say hello to our good friend, Mr. Grizzly, and ask how your mental health is doing today, sir. Well, good morning, Mr. Beaver. Um, I'm clearly not awake. Uh, I just I can't wake up this morning for some reason. I think it's just exhaustion. It's been a very busy weekend. I didn't have any actual time to rest yet, so today will be that day. It was just go, go, go all weekend long, getting errands done and chores and, you know, taking care of stuff. Uh, Did some work on the studio, did some work at Bridget's house. Um, Yeah, just busy, busy, busy. So I'm going to take a nap immediately after this. Same here. In in, in response to your question of how's my mental health, (laughs) I have no idea. I'm, I'm too tired. Uh, well, I am too, because for some bleep, 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 bleeping reason, <laughs> yesterday mm-hmm. was my first day off, like fully off since sometime mid-December. Oh, yeah. No rehearsals, Nothing. no shows, 
no meetings, no board meetings, no medical appointment, like just nothing. I guess, and I'm now back to my regularly scheduled life, like this five months of just complete running around like a chicken with my head cut off are now over so I can uh, I breathe. Gonna, yeah, so summer season, there's no there's no plays during the summer, right? Yeah, there's one play left this season and we have a oh. one-act festival uh, and then you got to do the launch of the new season and stuff like that, but I don't have to produce. I'm not in a show. I do not have a show booked. I am not aware of any auditions <laughs> coming, <laughs> coming up. Uh, uh, you know, so... Uh, curling season is over so um i have tennis literally nice. tennis and that's it and I, I am very very happy for that because i am very 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 tired so um oh yeah my bye bye i am running on fumes mm -hmm. so uh, and I, and it, it, and it shows. I, I, I've been making uncharacteristic errors, and like the last show we did, we had to print the programs twice because I set the wrong file for printing. Oh, yeah. That's... first time. Yeah. Um, so you know, I'm making mistakes. I'm making mistakes that are costing money. So that's um, really good. It, yep. It, 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 I need. I needed to stop. So uh, I'm grateful for this. So I um, we get to home and from the last show, and of course, you know get the adrenaline because we had a sold out lot cool. and family was there which was nice including my niece and my nephew who i love with all my heart uh and it's only the second time that they get to see their uncle on stage because it's the only the second time i'm in something that's age appropriate mm. and well no sorry age appropriate and they're also available to come down um so, but, uh, you know, all the thing again, it's like, yeah, why is uncle Douglas not here, you know, for this party and this thing? Well, he's in rehearsal. So yeah, okay, yeah well, that's why. And well, you know, and he's, he's kind of okay at it. So, you know, yeah. um, so we had that show and family was there and it was great. But of course you have the adrenaline high. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that went until about two in the morning and then I, the crash came and then it's like nothing to do the next morning, not even a show. Guess what time this one wakes up all on their own? Five. About 5.45. Yeah, of course. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and last night also was a short, last night I also for some reason, um, I was on high, it was the same thing. And I think last night was even later, it was around like three o'clock or something like that. We got to bed, which is like very, very abnormal because often I'm in bed by 10.30. Um, so yeah, there will be a nap. There will be a nap. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, mm -hmm. do you uh, notice something? Um, what am I noticing? That you're pink? <laughs> no, nothing you don't. What? No, don't no, notice nothing? no, no, mascara? no, Mr. Beaver's a year older. Oh, was it your birthday this weekend? Yesterday. Oh, shit. Sorry, man. <laughs> I, sorry. I'm, <laughs> hey, it was a long weekend. You were supposed to take it off. <laughs> well, I didn't, though. I was working the whole time. I didn't know. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I forgot your birthday. Da, 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 da. And now you're out of focus. I what the hell is going on? I am red and fuzzy. <laughs> I, right now, I am an advertisement. Oh, my God. I was... Somebody's going to clip this and make this, but who cares? Yes. I'm going to say it right now. Right now, I'm an advertisement for venereal disease. Do we say that anymore? I don't think. Now we say just FDI. like, we I don't know say, what this is, but this nobody is says like, VD anymore. Are you red and fuzzy? And <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody says VD anymore. Okay, you know what? This it's is an STI. Like... <laughs> it's an STI. I'm... My headset keeps going out. Uh, okay, listen, this is not happening. I'm, I'm going to try and reboot again. <laughs> yeah, I think you should do that. While you do that, I'll, I'll read something to you. Uh, before, just before you disappear, I'm going to read, I'm gonna read a, a tweet from an individual talking about the um, Iranian president and his death yes. in the helicopter crash this weekend. So you can go ahead, jump in and out. I'm going to read this tweet to you, which I think is rather poignant. And uh, I'm not going to tell you who wrote it. Because they can be deemed, maybe possibly deemed problematic. 
but I will read this to you because I think it's, I think it's poignant and accurate and should be said. Okay. So here I we go. I will be back and uh, see, uh, it, it'll take a couple of minutes because reboot takes in a while, but uh, yeah, no problem. I'll be back, kids. Okay. We'll see you shortly. So from this individual on the Twitter, I wonder if as his helicopter went down, he felt the terror that thousands of others felt as he sent them to their execution. I should say there's a trigger warning before reading this. I'm giving you the trigger warning in advance. There's some terrible things being talked about in this tweet about some of the terrible things this man did to the Iranian people. So there is your trigger warning. If you need to step away, turn the sound off or mute for a moment or two, feel free to do so. I will start again. I wonder if as his helicopter went down, he felt the terror that thousands of others felt as he sent them to their execution. I wonder if while he was hurtling towards the ground, he felt the helplessness that thousands of his victims felt when the rope was tied around their necks. I wonder if he experienced just one iota of the pain and suffering that he caused thousands of victims and their families. I hope that he be remembered as an evil, cruel man, or better yet, forgotten altogether. Better that he be left in the dustbin of history, joining a long list of evil men who were looked upon with nothing but scorn and disgust. I hope that the leadership in Iran learn their lesson and leave the people of Israel alone, but I'm not holding my breath. I hope the people of Iran will one day be free from the tyranny of the Islamic regime that has brought their country to the brink of destruction. I hope the U.S. does not delude itself into thinking that the regime wants the same things we do, namely peace and security. They don't. They are willing to sacrifice every single one of their citizens and spend every last penny in order to wipe the Jewish people off the face of the planet. That is not someone you can make a deal with. The Islamic regime will fall. As history has shown us again and again, it is only a matter of time. A corrupt and brutal dictatorship cannot last forever. The people will grow more and more resentful until one day the feelings will reach critical mass, and that will be the end. I hope that Khomeini spends the rest of his miserable life looking over his shoulder to see if the Mossad is behind him, and looking in front of him to see whether the, his people will accept the latest round of executions and torture of their fellow citizens. So as I said, that was pretty brutal. But we were talking about a brutal man who did brutal things to his people. And, well, that, that is a good question, Jillian. Uh, was the helicopter crash an accident? Apparently it was because he crashed. They, they crashed in foggy uh, conditions, uh, heavy, thick fog in, in a mountainous area, apparently. Well, and, and Linda, you know, the saying, don't say, only speak. Uh, we should not speak ill of the dead. We should only say good things about the dead. Well, in this case, he's dead. Good. He was a horrible human being who did horrible things to his people. Thank you, darling. And he deserves to uh, have suffered in his last few moments on this earth. And I sincerely mean that. He executed thousands of people. So many that they were using forklifts to do it. Well, sir, you, you seem to be looking more like yourself now. You're, you're back and in proper color, a little out of focus, but at least, uh, at least you're not shaded in pink anymore. So <laughs> we'll take that as a win. Um, even though you are uh, a little, a little out of focus, that's okay though. I don't think you have your mic yet. Yes. The, the, uh, Iranian president was absolutely a butcher. He was, uh, a horrible human being. an absolutely terrible person who did terrible things to his people. Uh, I'm, some of the things I've read about were just beyond horrific to the point where... Uh, another trigger warning here. If, if um, sexual violence or violence towards women is, is, is problematic, you, you should probably click off for the next 30 seconds while I tell you what one of the things they did was... Because uh, in Islam, according to whatever warped version they have, one uh, edict that they would follow was that you cannot execute virgins. So, 
They would rape the women before they executed them. So, you know, how he met his final moments, I hope he suffered horribly. I hope he burned alive and suffered through it. And I sincerely mean that because fuck that guy. And that's pretty much all I got to say. Yeah. In terms of a little bit of uh, the facts here, uh, Iranian state television confirmed that President Ibrahim Rahisi died in a helicopter crash into a mountainous area where conditions were foggy. Uh, the term that has been used, I believe, was adverse weather. Iran's interior minister uh, uh, on television uh, described it as a rough landing uh, when reporting back to uh, the citizens. Uh, the president was returning from an event in Iran's East Azerbaijan province where he was opening up a dam. The country's foreign minister, Hossein Amir Abdullahian, was also killed in the crash. No other bodies were found at the site, it is reported. Um, as uh, Mr. Grizzly, you know, uh, read that um, to give a little bit of a history of the man. He was president since 2021, and he was seen as a potential candidate to take over as the supreme leader, which is the highest leadership role in the nation. He was a hardline protege of the current supreme leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei. Uh, there will be an election in Iran in the next two months. So, um, be for to, to replace uh, the, this position. Uh, in Iran, the president has very little say on foreign policy. That's more the domain of the Supreme Leader and the Revolutionary Guard. Um, but uh, in his years in power, he oversaw um, for times where there was a challenging economy in Iran, anti-government protests and war in the Middle East. But in the 1980s, he was a member of the judiciary as uh, Mr. Grizzly says, who sent thousands of political prisoners to their deaths. Um, until the new elections, the vice president will be the acting president. Uh, so they will have a, a little bit of a continuity. Uh, the government has declared five days of national mourning, and uh, officials are vowing uh, that there will be a continuity and that it will be maintained, but international analysts are seeing the potential for a, a power struggle to emerge at this point. So things may get um, uh, a little tumultuous, to say the least. That's about the, the best word I can uh, come up with at the moment. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, huge news. It's huge news because uh, yeah, Iran is, uh, when we look at uh, that region of the world, uh, we say that there are three poles, Saudi Arabia being one, Israel being the other, and Iran is the third. So that's um, that uh, shapes a lot of things. And there are a lot of people uh, that are cheering, that are saying good. Uh, and, and yes, absolutely. Um, but this is Iran. Mm -hmm. So, um, when the devil goes down, um, I shudder at what comes next to fill the void because this was the devil we knew. What's the next one going to be like? Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, there's that. Yeah, exactly. That's it. So I, I don't, you know, people, you know, you can be happy that this person, I mean, listen, the world's a better place without this person in it. What? What replaces? So, uh, yeah, it's going to be, uh, there might be some sparks in that area of the world. Yes, uh, here at home, um, there's been some improvement in the wildfire situations. Uh, yesterday morning, not yesterday morning, sorry, Saturday morning, uh, around 10 a.m., uh, CBC was reporting that favorable weather conditions, uh, when we had been reporting this on the show, were, uh, were uh, being forecast entering the long weekend and that they were providing hope for residents across the country. Cooler temperatures and rain in the forecast did indeed help fire crews in Fort McMurray 
uh, region wildfire activity was low throughout the day on Friday, and the danger level had been downgraded to low. But officials still at that point on Friday were not letting their guard down. It, um, it did rain, though, in, in Fort Mac, did it not? Oh, oh yes, it did. It did. It did. Um, so uh, the regional fire chief at that time on a Saturday, Saturday, around Saturday morning had said, we can all look out the window and see the rain that's coming down on us, and that Mother Nature is gracious with that. We'll take every bit of it, and with that comes the possibility of different return dates, but we are going to make sure that it's safe to do so. So the residents that had left out of precaution as of a Saturday morning uh, were able to return home. Those under evacuation order at that time, um, uh, they thought would be able to return on Tuesday. In northwest Manitoba, the nearly 700 residents that had been forced out by wildfire near Cranberry Portage uh, found out that they would be likely to be able to return home over the course of the weekend. Manitoba's wildfire service said that the fire was under control and that the weather had been cooperative, so that was as of Saturday morning. In British Columbia's northeast, rainy weather and cold temperatures helped the crews battle the Fort Nelson fire, but officials at that time said it was too early to say when thousands of displaced residents could return home. The Parker Lake fire at that time was burning at 12,000 hectares, approximately two kilometers west of Fort Nelson. Um, as of uh, yesterday, things improved even more. Uh, the Northern Rockies Regional Municipality Mayor, Rob Fraser, uh, provided an assessment of how long it would take for evacuees to be allowed to return home up uh, in the, the Fort Nelson area. So, uh, and he says, uh, quote, I'm really hoping we'll be able to knock it down from 10 to 14 days to 7 to 10 days. So based on current conditions, that's the assessment. Rain has helped combat the fires and the crews still do not have the upper hand of the fire in that area. But the evacuees from Fort McMurray and the Cranberry Portage area of Manitoba are now able to return home. Yay! Evacuation orders and alerts for both areas are being rescinded today, we have found out. Well, that's good. Yes. Good news. Yes. At least, uh, yeah, there was some uh, some rain and whatnot. Because, I mean, last year, Mother Nature was not very cooperative with that. Mm. So, but again, this is, uh, it's... It's May. Mm -hmm. It's May. Well, I mean, it, they already started to fight them. Well, I mean, it, they never stopped burning to begin with. They yes. burned all through the winter, but they started to fight them in April. Yeah. So, yikes. I know. It's really something. Uh, it's going to be another scorcher here in the nation's capital today, by the way. I think we're the high is 30 and 33 with Humidex or 35, something like that. So it's going to be very, very warm here. 37 is body temp, remember that. So it's warm out. It's very warm out. It is very warm out. Um, the Prime Minister is going to announce, uh, or has announced, I should say, a by-election, a federal by-election for the uh, electoral district of Toronto St. Paul's. That is the district that was held by um, longtime MP and cabinet minister Dr. Carolyn Bennett who had uh, retired, and I believe now is the ambassador to Denmark, oh. if I'm not mistaken, uh, which was uh, announced uh, relatively shortly after she had stepped, uh, she had stepped aside. Uh, so, yes. Um, so, yeah, June 24th will be the federal by-election there. That one will be interesting, given what uh, polling is indicating at the moment, because... Um, that would be an opportunity. Let's just put it this way: If the Liberals, that she's owned that seat for a long time. She's she's owned that seat since that electoral district was created. The boundaries of it, the current one. Uh, so, and it's reputed to be some of the most safe liberal seats that are out there. So, if that one would happen to switch hands during a by election, um, expect many trees to sacrifice their lives. Mm -hmm. For the right wing press in Canada to be writing how much, you know, I mean, I think we would have to agree too, though, it, it, that might be the death knell <laughs> if that mm. was the case. Yes. Uh, we might, uh, might uh, not so much a long walk in the snow, but uh, a nice surf in Tofino. Yes. Uh, it's like if that, uh, if that one went another way. But we are living in very weird and interesting times. So mm. um, 
right now, I'm not assuming anything. Well, weird and interesting times. Let's 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 take a, a close look at, at at what's happening right now within the Khan Party. A progressive conservative. He was elected a progressive conservative um, a member of provincial par- uh, provincial legislature, I should say, in, in Alberta, and then moved on to federal politics. Ron, uh, I hope I say his surname correctly, Liepert, L-I-E-P-E-R-T. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put this on the screen for you right now. It's uh, Conservative MP Ron Liepert speaks out on his vision to leave politics. He says, people trying to get clips for social media are running the show in question period now. I just don't think that's healthy for democracy. I don't think it's healthy for communicating with Canadians. So here's a man who is, he'll be 75 in October, actually, isn't like, that, he does not look his age. <laughs> I thought he was like early 60s, maybe late mm. 50s. Uh, way to go, Ron. Uh, I don't know what your secret is. Oil of Olay? Damn, dude. But um, yeah, he, he's he's done. He's fed up because he can't handle... Uh, look, we've, we've heard other members of caucus from the conservative party say this is not how things are done and have left and here's a guy who has been dedicated to his province and his home of calgary he was born in alberta or saskatchewan sorry but he's he's been living in calgary for decades and he's a member of uh, parliament for um calgary is it nose hill i think let me just uh-huh. see here um he previously served in Cabinet of Alberta as Minister of Finance, Energy, Health and Wellness and Education under Premiers Ed Stelmack and Alison Redford. Well, Alison Redford. Uh, Calgary West. Yeah, he was a member of the Legislative Assembly of Alberta representing the constituency of Calgary West and he won the Federal Conservative nomination Cal- Calgary Signal Hill, defeating incumbent Rob Anders. was elected to Parliament in 2015. He was re- re-elected in 2019 and 2021. So here's a gentleman who spent a very long time in political office. Uh, 2011 was when he first, uh, no, sorry, wait, it goes back even further. My goodness gracious. 2004, Legislative Assembly for, uh, of Alberta for Calgary West. So he's been in politics for the last 20 years. Uh, he's originally from Salt, Salt Coats, uh, Saskatchewan. And after 20 years in politics, he's, he's like, I'm out, I'm done. He's tapped. And I understand it because, let's face it, uh, when the inmates start to run the asylum, as you know, that's definitely what we're witnessing these days. Do you know if that's a recent quote? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, because I got an article uh, from uh, February 2023 that announced uh, that he would not be seeking re-election. Well, he's still he's still a member. Yes, like yes, still- yes, yes, yes. Yeah, he did. He didn't step down. He just announced that he would not be seeking re-election. So I mean, he had already decided over a year ago that he was not going to run again. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if the two are related, though. I mean, a year and a half is a long time to to get to see because at that time, uh, he said he had every confidence that Conservative leader Pierre Poilievre will form Canada's next federal government. He said he was disappointed he won't have the opportunity to serve in that government. So I'm guessing his uh, yeah, his uh, decision to leave at that time was uh, strictly uh, for whatever personal reasons he was leaving, but uh, he's had a chance to see Pierre in action mm-hmm. for about a year, a year and a quarter since then. And uh, I'm guessing he's not impressed. Speaking of people who are not impressed... Mm-hmm. Mr. Grizzly. Uh, the other day we showed Speaker of the Legislature in Saskatchewan, Randy Weeks's cut up membership card to mm-hmm. the Saskatchewan party. Um, something similar has happened again. Yeah, let me just pull up the feed here. I had it a second ago. I lost it somehow. There so, um, yeah. I have it. Okay. This is so interesting. We'll so about it. Randy Weeks, who cut his card up, we now have um, I'm not Ali sure who Fanjoy. It is. Ali Fanjoy, okay, a member of the Conservative Party of Canada, is doing the same. I'll show you the video here. You can see she's got the card out. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put this. Yeah. I don't want the sound because it's very annoying. But there she is, cutting up her membership card. Doing it uh, live on the TikTok, uh, just 
as, as have many other people go, okay, enough is enough. And as I understand it, in her case, her last straw was um, Pierre and the Conservatives attempting to ban abortion in Canada. That was her, that was it for her. She's like, nope, I'm out. I'm out. I mean, better late than never, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not going to pick on this person because I don't know them. But, you know. Maybe an actual, maybe an actual progressive conservative. A progressive, right. And now this person is like, okay, they've crossed the final bridge. They've, you know, the final straw that broke that camel's back is, uh, has been tossed on the pile and it's time to, it's time to peace out, which a lot of people are doing, right? Because I'm sorry, they just, they just can't, they can't be st- robbing people of their rights, stripping their rights away that were hard fought and won over decades. Yeah. Uh, now, and, and tell you that, you know, this is for your good. This is for, no, 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 no. When you take somebody's choices away, it's never good. My God, no, that's horrible. But here's, a, we've seen this play before. Mm-hmm. Watch, look what's going on. Okay. Our good friend, Ryan Lilly livered. Mr. Grizzly, what did he have to say? Justin Trudeau is pushing the abortion debate hard right now. He and his team are making false claims. Why? They are desperate. Yeah. Whoops. Sorry. That was supposed to happen. Um, yeah. So you got uh, Brian Lilly doing that thing again that conservatives do when liberals start talking about abortion. And they turn around and they go, oh, my God, they're pushing the abortion debate again. Why do they always do that? They keep on saying mean things about us. That happened to be true, but we don't want people to say them out loud. Yeah. <laughs> well, what? That's what it boils down to. So you got my I know it's lead. true, but I don't like to hear it. So here we go. Okay. Like, so Ryan Malt, my God, this is just such an old one, but here we go. If we're talking about abortion, it must be the month of May in Canada. Happy Mother's Day, all. Mm. This year, trailing badly in the polls, Justin Trudeau is keeping up the pro-abortion rhetoric, warning women that voting for conservatives will put him at risk. He did that Thursday at a campaign-style stop in New Brunswick to push the government's plan for a national school food program, the bastard. Mm. We will keep fighting for women's rights, Trudeau said. He said that as if our Supreme Court had ruled abortion a right, as it once had in the United States. That never happened in Canada. We simply have an absence of law. But Trudeau loves to import American political issue into Canada while decrying American-style politics. This article is Trudeau introducing American-style politics. Mm -hmm. That's hilarious. All right. Yeah. Uh, but I digress. What really has Trudeau riled up about abortion in New Brunswick is that they stopped funding abortion at a private clinic. Quote, the shutting down of health and reproductive services offered by Clinic 554 for the unwillingness to engage in allowing women to actually choose what happens to their future, their bodies, is a disgrace, Trudeau said. Does anyone not find it odd that liberals are against private health care delivery if it's for knee replacement surgery or cataracts, but are all in favor of private abortion clinics? Once again, if the Trudeau liberals didn't have double standards, they wouldn't have any at all. Oh, my God. Officials, this is the shit they feed their people. Officials with the government of New Brunswick say roughly two-thirds of all abortions in the province are carried out with the abortion pill known as Mifigit. Uh, I don't have, my uh, God, I don't, this is not it's the a one long I know. chemical word, don't worry Mifigit, 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 Mifigit. Don't even bother, don't even bother, yeah. don't waste your time. It, it's not the one that I keep on hearing about, the one in, in, in mm-hmm. methapristone that I keep on hearing about in the United States. Move on. That, don't that has resulted, yeah, I, no, I don't know how to pronounce that, but to save my life. That was resulted in less, <laughs> that has resulted in less demand for surgical abortions, which New Brunswick still funds in hospital settings. Not good enough for Trudeau. He wants private clinics to provide abortions using public money. Here's the thing about this annual fight of over abortion that appears around Mother's Day. It doesn't matter. Nothing's going to change. And here's that thing, okay? It's like mm-hmm. he's saying that Justin Trudeau's like, 
he's the one that's okay with private care for everything except for abortion. He's the one. He wants private clinics to provide abortions using public money. Just like any other medical procedure. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it there, it's because we don't, when it comes to paying for a medical procedure, regardless of what it is, whether it's a knee, whether it's a hip, or whether it is abortion, if it is done in a private clinic, it's public money. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, while he's saying it's the other people, he's the one that's saying that's saying that it's somehow outrageous that we're using public money to provide this medical service but not all the others. But he's accusing that these, these guys are masters of flipping everything. Here's the thing about this annual fight over abortion that happens around Mother's Day. It doesn't matter. Nothing's going to change. Well, of course it happens around Mother's Day because the campaign, the, the National Prayer Breakfast, and then the whole rally on the hill are scheduled for the... They picked that date. Mm -hmm. That whole thing that you were complaining about, like International Day of, you know, trans trans visibility, having been picked specifically to like fall on Easter this year, when it's on that date every year for the last ten years. This one, they ask, hey, at what date are we going to do that rally on the hill? Let's pick around Mother's Day. They did that. <laughs> Again, they do what they accuse us. If they're accusing us of doing it, it's because they've already done it, are currently doing it, or have plans to do it. That's the conservative way. Over the years, there have been countless polls on the issue of abortion and what it shows. If you read these polls honestly, it's that the Canadian public has a complex relationship with this issue. Uh, no. No, not really. <laughs> We're, we're the, the overwhelming majority of us are pretty much clear that even if we wouldn't want one for ourselves, we don't want to tell other people what they can and can't do. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're pretty clear on I that. I would like to think so. Brian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's just, most don't want abortion banned, but many are open to restrictions being placed on abortion at some point in the pregnancy. There already are. But it is the medical associations that have decided based on their best knowledge of medical science when that is. We call it a health service. We put it to the healthcare system and then we trust the healthcare system and its self-regulating bodies especially since they have a Hippocratic oath of first doing no harm, do no harm, that they will not deliver the service in a manner that is absolutely outrageous. And it's worked very well. For a very long time. It's like, you have an issue and you keep on trying to make it our issue. And we're not interested in that issue. <laughs> it's like, just, uh. So, yeah. And then, he, you know, and then again. Is, in Canada, there is no limit on when an abortion can take place. Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. that, to say otherwise is ridiculous. Yes, there is. <laughs> it's just determined by the medical profession and not people that we elect in a house of commons that are not coming at it from a place of science and best interest of the patient. That's all. If you can get a doctor to provide an abortion in the ninth month of pregnancy, it's not a thing. It is perfectly legal and paid for. We have zero restrictions on abortion. Not a thing. Not a thing. Something about reason, nuts, candy and stuff. It, it, well, the only reason they would ever, ever have that if it was, um, detrimental to the life of the mother. And even then they would do all their, they would make all their efforts to save the baby. Who has a nine month abortion? What the fuck kind of stupidity is that? I'm sorry. You wouldn't carry it that long and then have, that is the stupidest goddamn thing I think I've heard today. Mm -hmm. It's early though. 
It's early. There's plenty of time for more stupid shit to be heard. Then he lists a bunch of countries that have restrictions. So Germany, for example, in Germany, there are some limits placed on abortion after 12 weeks, in Italy after 13, in France after 16, the UK after 24. Countries like Ireland, Portugal, Japan, Sweden, and Spain have varying levels of restrictions raised. Yes, because they have a law specifically dealing with abortion. We don't because we consider it a medical service. That's it, it's a medical procedure. Nothing. We more. haven't had a law on abortion in Canada since the Supreme Court struck down the old one in the Morgan Teller decision in 1988. We aren't likely to get one anytime soon. Good. Despite the overheated rhetoric from the liberals about electing a conservative government. <laughs> no, no, if we elect a conservative government, trust me, they're looking, going to look to put a law. So this, no, no, we, we would never do that. We would never do that. Even in the Conservative Party, there's no appetite to ban abortion, not among the majority. A free vote held in the Commons on a bill to restrict abortion after the six-month mark wouldn't even pass. All of the posturing, the lecturing, yes, because it wouldn't pass because you don't want to set a freaking first benchmark. Again, it is not your job as a legislator to determine when and how medical procedures mm. take place. Period. <laughs> Jeez. All of the posturing, the lecturing, and the social media posts on this issue from the Trudeau liberals and their allies in the media is simply a sign of their desperation as liberal poll numbers fall further. So again, so desperation. Oh my God, it's May. They're talking about abortion. Why do they always do that? Blah, blah, blah. It's the typical, typical, typical whine. But didn't we just show last week or the week before MC Homo Milk standing up in the House of Commons? Mm-hmm. Is reading in a petition. Something, something, something preborn, something, something preborn, something, something preborn. Yeah. I was like, look, I'm gonna sit there because like, you ever notice that the conservative types, the pro CBC types of the media, they're complaining about liberals pushing abortion just after conservatives raise the debate while never mentioning the fact that conservatives just can't seem to shut up about it. And nudge, nudge, wink, wink, mentioned the notwithstanding clause, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, without actually yes. saying notwithstanding clause. Like this. And then for a first few couple of days after mentioning it, right, not right away when asked, well, do you plan to use it on other things? No, 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 just this. Let that fester for a couple of days, get the blowback, and then, turn, and then say, oh, no, I don't plan to use it. Well, we don't believe it. Listen, we wouldn't have believed it if you said it immediately. I would have, because I don't trust you further than I could throw you, Pierre Polyev. But when you're asked the first few days and you leave it vague, and then after two, three days when all the blowback and you have the time to pull on it comes back and you turn around and you say, oh, I wouldn't use anything else, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Because mm -hmm. if somebody's going to ask you if you're going to use the notwithstanding right clause to heart, to suspend any other rights after you already announced that you would, and you need to go before you give me a yes or a no, you will. You will. Mm -hmm. Because if you weren't thinking about it at all, you wouldn't have to think about answering that question. It would be reflexive. Well, there's some weird stuff going on in that... Uh conservative party across the country in each province, uh, federally, provincially, there's just some weird stuff happening. And they do want to rob women of their rights, right to make a medical decision about their bodies. And again, I will say this one more time. You can be pro-choice and anti-abortion. You can be those two things. It's entirely possible to be pro-choice and anti-abortion because to be pro-choice means you are not telling somebody else what to do. You don't want to have an abortion? Don't have one. Pretty simple, right? Mm. And in weirdness, thing, in weirdness in conservative party. Oh, hold on, hold on. The thing that you, you need to answer again, when they keep on saying, somebody had sent something at one point and I wish I, I had booked market, but the mm. sheer number of of times that party introduces backdoor legislation, mm -hmm. yes. private member bill legislation, meets with the Campaign Life Coalition, speaks on the Hill at their rallies, mm -hmm. tables a petition all every single freaking time. They're the ones who can't shut up about it. 
And when the liberals turn around and say, you know what? They're talking about it again. Oh, they initiate the debate. Each and every time. Every bleep, bleep time. Sorry, Mr. Goodley, I, I jumped in. That's okay. I've got something. I, I don't know if you saw this or not, sir, so I'm going to put it on the screen because it's, I don't, I don't know. I don't, oh. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what is going on in Alberta. Youth Spring Dance and Soul, Saturday, June 8th from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. Ages 14 to 25. I'm sorry, what, what? So, um, pardon me, what? Youth Spring Dance and Social, ages 14 to 25. Mm-hmm. Now, do you not find that uncomfortable and strange and odd and ew? Because I sure as hell do. What is going on in Clive, do. Alberta? I personally, but I come from a very different background. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the gay community. Right. Right. So when I came out, we had a group. It was called mm -hmm. Gay Youth that was organized by the local. Every Wednesday, we would go and we'd have a discussion group. We'd have people come in. They'd talk to us about stuff, you know, and like this. And we'd meet and we'd make friends like this, you know. And it was a, a safe environment. It was at a commu our, our community center. And, you know, it was organized. It was part of the programming. And every Friday night, there would be a bar night. Mm -hmm. It would be a dry bar night. Oh, and so where everyone cool. in that group... Right, from whatever to, from I think I think it was for us sixteen to twenty five. This would go there, and it was a place where we could dance, all of us, because we don't think of people twenty four twenty five as youth. No, but according to the United States, the United Nations, youth is from about the time you start high school until you finish your first cycle of university. Really? About that, yes. Aren't you an United adult Nations, 18? Legally? You're an adult, but youth, mm. young adult, is still part of youth, according to like the international definition. Okay, fine. Now, but why now, would you but, so, but that's the context. It does matter. But that, mm. that's just overall context. When people go, okay. it's like 15 are not youth, international and international law, people are considered right. youth until 25. So, in that group, People that are 22, 23, 24, 25 can also be going to a bar yes. and getting hit on by 40-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And they don't want that. So we were there all together mm -hmm. with proper supervision, mm -hmm. no alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yes, And we had 14-year-olds dancing with 25-year-olds in the same room. But there were very few 14-year-olds, none at all that I can remember, dancing with 25 year olds, like slow dancing, grinding, face. This might be all dancing in a circle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> might be dancing next to someone while you're dancing with your friends. Maybe it's square dancing. Right? So, and so, and then we're talking about this is like in the small, small town, Alberta. Mm hmm. So I'm guessing if you're going to rent a hall to do that type of thing, and there's probably not a lot of population. Well, that is one, rather of, the, than one of the explanations I heard was. Hold a 14 to 18, why not? But the point is, is that on its face, depending on who the organizers are, mm -hmm. how much adult supervision there is, mm -hmm. all kind of stuff, it is quite, quite, quite possible to safely operate a dance Mm -hmm. where 14-year-olds and 25-year-olds dance in the same room and nothing bad happens. Has anybody been to a family wedding, for example? Mm -hmm. Right? So, yes, at first, it seems, ooh. Yes. And, and yes, if we were talking about, hey, 14-year-olds to 25-year-olds, here, I'll go in this room, and, hey, we're going to have a dance, and we're, we're going to, create an event where 14 year olds are going to mingle with 25 year olds in the same room like this and uh, have no adults there whatsoever while we leave minors. Yeah, 
then I would be really, really worried. But I would assume that there would be adult supervision. Well. Please tell me. There would, somebody should ask the organizers, would there be adult supervision? You know, when I was a teenager, which was about 100 years ago, uh, I used to go to, uh, on, on the military bases I grew up on, we always had a teen town. And it was 14 to 18. Yep. You could not get in if you were over 18, unless oh, yeah. you were a, a, a chaperone. Because we always had adults in the room, right? There was, you know, a, a minimum of three at any one given time yeah. uh, to supervise and make sure everything went well and we didn't burn the place down or, you know, get too outlandish. Mm -hmm. But 14 to 18. And, and because, kids can be not okay with each other. That's true. It's, right. not like, it's not like you can have a room of 14 to 18 year olds. Sorry, it was 13 to 18. Yeah, okay. But, and that nothing bad would happen among them. Mm-hmm. Hello, world junior hockey. Well, 19 year olds weren't allowed in because you were of drinking age. Of drinking age. Right. Exactly. But the it's age just of majority so that uh, they, they would not allow them in because, you know, there's just. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So optically, <laughs> not, not this good. is horrible. Not a good look. Not a good look. <laughs> it's a horrible thing. I say, if you are organizing stuff like this, particularly if you're a political party, not you a good look. probably should know better. It's like, you know what? Let's do 14 to 19, right? And, and then 19 and over. Cassie, I find the fact that UCP is hosting the youth dance, youth dance more problematic, right? Mm -hmm. Are we not? <laughs> that whole part completely got sidelined. But here's the thing about that tweet that's really, really, really interesting about that thing. is because how did this come to light? It's because somebody on Twitter that goes by Sergeant Kerry Shima, who everybody says is an actual RCMP uh, officer and that works in this kind of stuff, posted a tweet. Um, uh, fortunately, um, I'm going to show it, uh, but I can't seem to get it to a, a big enough size to make it very clear. So I'm going to read it. Okay. For you. Uh, because the letters are, lettering is going to be very small. But, uh, Mr. Grizzly, you can show it. So uh, this is Sergeant Kerry Shima. Mm -hmm. Posts, uh, embeds the, the clip of the ad and says, this right here is a problem. One, 25-year-olds are not youths. Um, actually, they are. Technically, yes. Technically. Two, who planned this wanting to see 14-year-olds and 25-year-olds dancing together? When I read that, the That's frame weird. being put on that is that 14-year-olds are going to be paired with 25-year-olds mm -hmm. made to be bumping and grinding on each other because mm -hmm. somebody wanted to see this, and that is the entire purpose for this dance. Maybe so. But to uh, put that in print as a sergeant of the RCMP, yeah, suggesting they, uh, that, that is a very loaded statement. Very three. The Probably ICE why it was deleted. Three. The ICE unit is overworked with cases, and the last thing my teens need is a sanctioned dance encouraging adults to cavort with teens. So, two, who planned this wanting to see a sanctioned dance encouraging adults to cavort with teens? This Without saying it, but this is very heavily suggesting it, the people who organized this dance wanted to see 14-year-olds cavorting with 25-year-olds. And this dance is going, the people who organized this dance are going to encourage that. We, 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 don't, we don't know that. That is assuming, a, listen, I'm not a fan of the UCP at all. 
No, but that, that's and we question. know in rural Western Canada, there's all these pastors and there's a whole bunch of people who want to be able to have child brides. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that want to run the school boards. Yes. We know that. And keep and people, certain types of people out of physical education and drama. We know that all of this is bathing in really weird context. Mm -hmm. But to literally be an officer of the law says the ICE unit is overworked with cases and the last thing my teams need. My team, she's talking about, or he's talking about, sorry, uh, Carrie, okay, I, I can't even see the, the picture right now, so... Um, but talking about the teams for which they are responsible as a sergeant. Mm -hmm. Speaking in that capacity, saying this event, not, hey, is anybody concerned about this? Is anybody concerned about the possibility of something bad happening like this? Is mm -hmm. everybody considered? What are we going to do to ensure that if we're going to put 14 and 25 year olds together in the same room for a social, that there are measures in place to ensure that everybody's going to be able to purchase, not asking those questions. Does anybody consider the risk? No, this event was created for the sole purpose by people with some very sick minds to encourage 25 year olds to cavort with 14 year olds on a dance floor. That's yeah, one hell of a fucking leading. statement. Yeah. It's pretty leading. That's probably why it was deleted because that, that statement from the RCMP was deleted. Do you think somebody got a phone call from a UCP lawyer with the words defamation suit said? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's really leading. It's really assuming. Look, is and this any is of it a good? No. In the RCMP. You think somebody should know better Yeah. than to do that in that way? It was really poorly done. Poorly, poorly chosen choice of words and verbiage that led to, uh, well, the deletion of the tweet to begin with, but most likely no, was no. a call from a UCP lawyer. Right? I mean. The frame you put on things matters, man. Yeah. Hey, look, I, I think the whole thing is icky and disgusting myself, but. Yes. That was not the right way to go about addressing it. Not at all. That is not how you address something like that. Holy crap. Let's, can we shift gears here for a sec? Because it's, it's we're, we're dealing with a lot of ickiness and I've got something from Wab Canoe yes, in, in Manitoba. Please. Have you seen yes, this? A little palate cleanser. Palate cleanser. Know. This is a uh, Wab uh, to Hawa. Wow. And that was the entrance to the, um, the powwow oh, wow. at, uh, where, hang on a sec. I've got some info here. If I can just pull it up. Um, uh, green regalia joining in the grand powwow entrance at the Manitowahi gathering in Winnipeg this weekend. Manitowahi. Sorry. I had to sound that out as I read it. So yeah, some good news there. Some, something good because we've been, we've been a little dark from the beginning today. So yes, let's, let's shift gears, uh, lighten it up a little bit. It's uh, now, holiday Monday. Unfortunately, I have to darken it up again. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> well, hold on. Oh, no. Let me see if there's stuff. Since we're doing like this, yeah, since we're doing light, we'll continue doing light before I darken it up again. Um, the Department of Canadian Heritage has announced the acts mm -hmm. that will be performing in the nation's capital for Canada Day this year. Now, uh, the show will be called Canada Day Feel the Rhythm. And uh, the evening show will feature uh, none other than It's a Throwdown. Showdown. Throw. Hell no, I'm going to go down. Yeah, I, I was hoping you would complete it. I was hoping you would complete it. Thank you. Thank you for taking the baton. Maestro Fresh Wes, y'all. Thank you very much. I like that very much. I, that makes me happy. Also scheduled to perform our Chromeo, Corneille, uh, Fuki, Canon, Kaiser, 
Oak Eyes have not seen Yes. That. She played, was it last year or the year before she was at Pride? I can't remember. Uh, I didn't, I, would, I didn't have the energy. I didn't have the energy to stay up to see her. And it was Me only either. like, I was exhausted. I think she started at 6 p.m., but I'd been out all day yep. in the parade, right? And, and all, eight hours in the sun. Yep. You're, you're kind of done. Yes. Also, Neon Dreams, Quatu, Sarah Dufour, Willows, and Metric. Oh, cool. Ah, love Metric. Me too. They, so they've bad. kind of been under the radar for a little bit. They haven't put out any music. A little in a while. bit. Yeah, a little bit. So, yeah, very excited about that. Uh, so, uh, and the show uh, this year uh, will not be on the hill because of the construction. The runners, yeah. Uh, so it will be at La Breton Flats mm -hmm. uh, this year, and it will be hosted by Isabelle Racico. So, there you go. Very, very exciting. I, I, I'm, my favorite day of the year is my birthday, and my second favorite day of the year is Canada Day. Mm. So when I get Canada Day news, I get very, 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 very happy. <laughs> oh, Kit Carol, is it your birthday today? Happy birthday to you. Okay, I, nice. I just realized how old I am. Um, when I realize, uh, read, I'm reading here in the background. Uh, Metric uh, was founded in, how, how long do you think Metric has been around? The band. Take a wild guess. Early 2000s? 1998. Oh my goodness. Emily Haynes, the lead singer, um, is 50. Are you kidding me? No, she's 50. Yeah, she turned 50 in January of this year. January 25th, 1974. You know where she was born, though? No. New Delhi, India. I had no idea. Yeah, she's Canadian. I mean, yes. but but she was born in New Delhi. I'm um, I'm assuming her parents worked for the um, Canadian government and were posted there. I, I have no idea, but yeah, she was born in New Delhi. Oh my word! She has the vocal that range woman. of a mezzo soprano. Indeed, that no, that woman's been drinking milk. She looks good. Wow. Cool. So yeah, very, very excited. Ex exactly, Christian. She was part of broken social scene, indeed. Indeed. And that was a, a that was almost like um, a phenomenon in Canada. In a if uh, if you're not familiar with broken social scene, that was a that was a really big, 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 big deal. Uh, especially if you were um, uh, um, I, I guess a an incubator. In a way. Sorry, my 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 earpiece is going out. Say Sorry. that again, sir. Broken social scene. Broken social scene. Yeah, she is a a member of broken social scene. But broken social scene is also a band that, you know, people come and go. It's it's not. It doesn't have yeah. a permanent uh, permanent roster. It's sort of like an incubator. Like you come in, you do something, and then people have like come in through that, and then go off and lead yeah. things, and then some people come back, and it's a it's a it's a really yeah, it, it was a really cool thing. It was a kind of free-flowing mm -hmm. thing. Good idea. I think Brand Van 3000 was something like that too, wasn't it? Uh, I remember to a that. lesser degree. To a lesser degree. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, really, really good news. So thank you um, for that. All right. A little dark. Not as dark as the previous stuff, but a little dark. Um, it's about... There's been a case... Uh, in uh, Hamilton, where a child under five mm -hmm. uh, has uh, died of measles, according to the public health agency. Um, it's the first measles death identified via provincial surveillance since 1989, according to Public Health Ontario. Um, this is a profoundly tragic situation where a young child has left us too soon with their whole life ahead of them, said Dr. Brendan Liu, Hamilton's Associate Medical Officer of Health, in a statement Friday. To respect and protect the privacy of the child and their loved ones, we will not be speaking to further details of this individual case. But it's the first such death in Ontario since 1989 when tracking began, according mm. to public health. In an update published Thursday, Public Health Ontario said the child was not vaccinated against the highly infectious respiratory virus. It did not indicate when the child died or their specific age. So we just know a child under five. Um, 
A measles-related death is a rare and tragic event. Our thoughts are with the family during this difficult time. Uh, cases are on the rise. Hamilton Public Health has confirmed six cases of the measles so far this year. None of the individuals were vaccinated. Earlier this month, Public Health warned people about the possibility of measles exposure at a grocery store, apartment building, and McMaster Children's Hospital after four members of the same household contracted the virus. Hamilton Health Sciences, which runs the Children's Hospital, said in a statement it could not confirm whether or not the child who died was in their care, citing privacy reasons. Measles has also been on the rise in both Ontario and elsewhere in Canada as cases increase globally, particularly in Europe, which has seen tens of thousands of infections over the last year. There have been 22 cases in the province so far this year, Public Health Ontario says, a level of infections already matching a recent high set in 2014, when there was the same number over the entire calendar year. All of the cases were in people born after 1970, including 13 children. In 12 of those instances, the children were not immunized, while the vaccination status of one was unknown. Five infections, all in unvaccinated children under five years old, required hospitalization, the report says. In an email statement, a spokesperson for Ontario's Ministry of Health offered condolences to the family of the deceased child. Quote, our heart goes out to the family that has tragically lost their child. Our thoughts are with them as they navigate this challenging time. We remind all Ontarians to stay up to date with their vaccinations to ensure themselves and their loved ones are protected against infectious disease. Speaking in Winnipeg on Friday, Prime Minister Trudeau called the child's death, quote, a tragedy that nobody wants to see. I can't imagine what that family is going through right now, but I do know as a parent that all of us want the absolute best for our kids, he said. I recommend that everyone listens to their doctors, their health professionals on how to keep their kids safe. Most of the total measles cases this year, 15 of 22, were linked to travel. Quote, in Ontario, measles has been rare, owing to the successful elimination of measles in Canada and high immunization coverage. As a result, measles cases are predominantly associated with travel, the report says. Due to, due to an increase in measles activity globally, Ontario has begun to see more cases of measles. measles. Dr. Isaac Bogash, an infectious disease consultant at Toronto General Hospital, says Canadians planning to travel should ensure they are protected against the virus given the rise in infections abroad. Quote, the vaccine is extremely effective, it's safe, it's widely available, and it's free. Is it perfect? Of course not. Nothing's perfect, but it's really, really, really good, he told CBC Radio's Metro Morning on Friday. Bogosh said interruptions to, to routine childhood vaccination schedules during the COVID-19 pandemic means that some children may have missed a dose. For Canadian children, the typical schedule is now two doses, both administered before they enter school. The first dose of the combined measles, mumps, and rubella MMR vaccine should be given when a child is 12 to 15 months of age and a second at 18 months or any time after that, but no later than around school entry notes the Canadian Immunization Guide. For infants set to travel internationally with their caregivers, especially to destinations with high rates of measles infection, the first shot can be moved up to six months in some cases, Balgosh said. So we don't know the age of the child. We know that the child was under five. If the child was under a year old, wouldn't have been eligible for measles yet for the vaccine, for the first dose. Now, the reason I'm mentioning mm -hmm. this is because upon hearing this news, there's been a lot of people, their first reaction was those parents should be criminally charged because they didn't get their child vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Okay. I understand that sentiment. Oh, yes. However, you've got to ask the question. Mm -hmm. If parents lose a child due to a medical decision that they took on their child's behalf. And it was an unwise decision mm -hmm. or a decision that didn't work out. Is the loss of the child punishment. not already the most severe punishment? Mm -hmm. What benefit to society is there from charging and incarcerating a parent that would lose their child in yeah, that it's, manner? It's, it's a good question, and I don't have an answer to it. No. I don't. I honestly don't. Uh, the, you know, there's just other things to be discussed here. Was, uh, doctors have said because of the pandemic, a lot of children's vaccinations have kind of fallen off because not necessarily due to uh, parents choosing not to vaccinate in so much as the schedule was sidelined and now they're trying to get caught up and there's a huge backlog. 
Yes. Was so, that the case? We don't know. We don't know. So it, you, you the, can't go and hang this person right away. Yeah. We don't know the we story. Know. We don't know. But let's say, even in a situation, let's say that these are anti-vax parents. Mm-hmm. And I'm not getting my child vaccinated against measles. That's just, they're not doing that. I want to go back to what the prime minister said. The child's death is a tragedy that nobody wants to see. I can't imagine what that family is going through right now, but I do know as a parent that all of us, I do know as a parent that all of us want the absolute best for our kids. I recommend that everyone listens to their doctors. Yes, I'm going to preface this. I said, yes, we live in a world where there are parents that are not good to their kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. But let's speak about the overwhelming majority of us. Do we assume that parents, do we enter this debate assuming that parents that do not have their kids vaccinated for whatever reasons Mm -hmm. that make sense to them love their children any less than other parents. And do we assume that if they lost their child as a result of an unwise decision that they made, that they would be any less devastated by the loss of their child Mm -hmm. than any other parent? Because that's what concerns me when I see this debate to rush with the pitchforks. I'm not defending anti-vaxxers. No, 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 no. I'm saying layering on additional punishment. You were negligent with your child, so now society is going to make you pay. Problem is, when it comes to vaccines, for example, people are thinking like, well, they didn't provide the necessities of life. Well, if you're not feeding your child, for Mm -hmm. example, it's like eating is not optional. You, you you can't bypass that one. You gotta you gotta do it. You gotta do it. Not accepting a recommended medical treatment is optional mm-hmm. under the law. Yes, and parents as guardians are given a lot of leeway. Well, and and you have to remember too. In many cases, in many instances, a school board will dictate that if your child is not vaccinated, they cannot come to our school. Right, because they put other children at risk. No but then crime, you have the option to homeschool, right? Yeah, there's no crime, but it's like you, these are our rules, and if you don't want to obey them, well, then you you can't play in this playground. Exactly. what it boils down to. You can, do, you, want, you can do what you want in your home, but you can't bring that here. Yes. Right? Um, so I have a, like I said, that, that when I see that, it's just like, mm, am I assuming, we're assuming a lot here, right? If you don't, bring your child we've seen about the cases for example of parents that believed in wellness therapies when their child was very very sick and you know it was very clear that they needed medical intervention no 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 and they got charged but again refusing medical treatment for example a preventive medical treatment like a vaccine is different than having full-blown meningitis and you have a fever and all that kind of stuff and say, I'm going to administer you herbs rather than bringing you to a doctor. And then they'll use the example of blood transfusions. Well, if you need a blood transfusion, I'm thinking that there's a a factor of urgency with regard to life. That is not the case when you're going to get a preventative vaccine. So, and under the law in Canada, there is no law, there's not much precedent or whatnot um, for regards to parents deciding that their child is not going to get a certain vaccination, which is a preventative treatment, as being fitting the definition of negligent. So it's, um, I understand hearing about a child dying 
needlessly, because this was indeed preventable, as a result of a fringe medical decision that their parents made with regard to getting a vaccine. And that most of us would not do that. And we don't understand that. Right? We want to do absolutely everything to protect our children. We don't understand why this parent would not. It's like, all oh, the science is out there. They know. Yeah. But uh, for whatever reason it is, the science has not convinced them. So I cannot go into this debate first assuming that just because a parent believes something that is just illogical and irrational to believe, because that that means that they have, that they don't, that they are not convinced that they are doing the best thing for their child. Right? They're not, they're not denying their child the vaccine because they hate their child. It's some twirled, twisted, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a very bad decision. It's a misguided decision, but is it a criminal one? I would say no. Is it? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So we have to. It's not criminal. It's it would be ordinary. nice that we lived in a world where here's the science, here's the data. Oh, well, I'm convinced. And then we all make the logical and rational decision. We are presented with the best possible information like this, and we make the best possible decision based on it. But we don't do that. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. We know what we should be eating. I don't want to like put those chemicals in my body. Everything is chemicals, you dumb. It's like the number of Doritos I put into my body over the weekend in the green room during the play it was severely unhealthy. <laughs> I, I, was, I was telling the guys yesterday, we, we went and had some porch plants and I was talking to them about how, you know, I, I actually knew people who said to me, oh, I'm not getting the vaccine. I don't know what's in it. I'm like, don't give me that crap. Yes. I've watched you buy cocaine from a bus boy in a strip joint and then do rails off the back of the toilet tank in the toilet of that same strip joint. Don't tell me that, you it's lying, about, foolish it's, idiot. Remember, it's not about you not knowing what you're putting in your body. Yeah. Let's, let, let's not pretend that's what it's about. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> the people who said that to me, I just, I want to smack you in the face. I, I really but, do. But here's the thing, is like, we're not, we're humans. We are inconsistent. Yeah, at best. We are inconsistent. Um, you know, there are things in certain areas that we know is bad, but here we, we calculate the risk and we deem it acceptable. We make a stupid decision, but we wouldn't consider it for, so well, would you do this? Well, no, that's like five levels higher of escalation. I wouldn't do that like this. But this one, I thought it was, you know, I thought I could handle it. I, think, uh, I thought I could do it. Or, like we're, We are not consistent yeah. at all. Plus, And we are not perfectly rational. How can, if, say, those parents were anti-vaxxers, and then there's us of us that do believe in vaccination, how can we both look at the same data and come to such wildly different conclusions? I, right? So who knows how people's minds work? Mm -hmm. But... We really, and there's a common theme with the two stories about mm -hmm. the dance and whatnot, is making assumptions about the intent of others when you idea. don't know them. Yeah. And that's the problem. What's one of our problems with our politics? Because if you're looking at a lot of these narratives, right? Because mm -hmm. if you listen to the conservative narrative about the, about the liberals, I guess there's always intent ascribed. Mm hmm Justin Trudeau is trying to destroy the nation. Justin Trudeau wants to take your rights. Justin Trudeau is coming for this. Justin Trudeau is coming for that. Justin Trudeau hates gun owners. Justin Trudeau hates the people well, that didn't that, that showed up in Ottawa to protest. Just, but it's always in, he wants to keep you down. Justin Trudeau wants to censor you. Justin Trudeau wants to 
force you to take, but there's always ascribing the worst of human intent. Mm -hmm. You can make your points about policy being bad without having to talk, say a damn word about the person actually proposing the policy. But they're not making that choice. They're not making that choice. Assuming, st make stating as a fact what other people's intent is as you frame a political issue for your partisan advantage. That's... <laughs> It's like, unless somebody specifically says what their intent is, you don't know. Look at this. There we go. More. This, again, this is Paul no, Yev on the weekend. Uh, tweeting out at a, at a gun rally on the 18th, which was Saturday. Trudeau and the NDB will ban all hunting rifles if they are reelected. I told these proud members of the bulk... Bulkley, Valley, Rod, and Gun Club that I will protect their right to safely and lawfully bring home the hunt while jailing the gangsters and gun smugglers Trudeau turns loose. Signed to support our common sense firearms plan. Okay, that he starts off with an outright lie. An outright lie. He starts off with one. And then, what did David Parker tweet on the same day? Hmm. There are 68,000 active members of the Canadian military. There are 30,092 active members of the RCMP. That is the entire force that the Canadian government can bring against its citizens. If there ever is a people's revolution, the Canadian government doesn't stand a chance. There are 4 million gun owners in Canada. And that's when you play the clip of uh, that guy doing the stand-up comedy routine that you've mentioned all the time. Neil Brennan. This doesn't really sound fair because I've got this um, drone. Yes. Yeah, I, I have the clip, but we can't show it because we no. have a copyright violation. But he goes on to say uh, the, the NRA uh, gun owners are going to have a rally against the, the U.S. military. It's a game we have once a year. And, uh, okay, we have... 50,000 uh, heavily armed uh, rifle, assault rifle, sporting NRA uh, members standing in the circle, and they're ready to start the games. And uh, we have the two members of the military here, two drone operators and one drone operator. It says, um, are we really going to do this? Because, you know, um, okay, here we go. Uh, and my drone is up, and uh, I'm just going to let go of that missile. And Oh, oh and they're all dead. <laughs> That's the end of it. Pretty much. That was the Neil Brennan <laughs> uh, commentary on what was it? He says uh, Neil Brennan has a plan to test the Second Amendment, and that's what it was. It's from his comedy special. Uh, Blocks is the comedy special. If you if you want to check it out, it's really funny. It's on Netflix, and he's his take on it is hilarious. Um, the, but this this is um, let me post this tweet from Nate uh, from the breakdown. Yeah, Jared Wesley said, sure, this is dangerous, undemocratic, threatening language, but let's calm down. It's not like he has access to camping equipment or pallets. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Sorry. The same fear they put into your hearts. Mr. We've got all the guns. Was that scared of a mask and some hand sanitizer? Hardcore. <laughs> oh, Nate, that was, that was, that was beautiful. That was, a, that was a thing of beauty, sir. That was uh. a thing of beauty. Now, getting back to Pierre, the one that you put out, um, Bruce Anderson, mm -hmm. man I respect very much, uh, had something to say about uh, Pierre's claim that Trudeau and the NDP will ban all hunting rifles if they are reelected. The casual obvious lie, which is what this is, is always revealing. It happens like if someone feels entitled to lie because their supporters love the lie, or they believe that lying can't keep them from winning. If media overlook it, the behavior just becomes more common. Mm -hmm. And Pierre wasn't done with the lies. He had another doozy 
for you. And about this one, Max Fawcett said, this is an astonishingly dishonest and inflammatory thing for a potential prime minister to say. It should be disqualifying, and that it isn't says a lot about a lot of things. We need solutions to this crisis, not weapons-grade scapegoating, and there isn't a shred of evidence supporting any link between federal policies and toxic drug deaths. And what did Captain Applesauce have to say about toxic drug deaths? Uh, Trudeau's wacko drug policies have killed 42,000 Canadians. After pushing to decriminalize hard drug use in public places, he is backtracking in the hopes he can impose it after the election when voters won't, can't stop him. Fire Trudeau, ban the drugs, treat addiction, bring our loved ones home drug-free. He tweeted that on Friday. That's uh, 42,000 Canadians is the number of Canadians that have died. Yes. The policies have not been in place. And they're also not Trudeau's policies, they're provincial policies. Yeah. It's by the province of British Columbia. All they did was ask that they were allowed to do this, and they were granted the ability to do so. But the policy is a provincial government initiative, not federal. The, the amount of lies this man spews and continues to get away with unanswered, is, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. But his policies have caused 42 thousand deaths yeah yeah that's not even true not true Forty-two thousand people have died but it's not his policies <sighs> there comes a time when you will say absolutely anything about it the vilification mm-hmm it's just, it's the just. The objective is to paint the man as evil. And as I keep on asking on the show, what is the solution for evil? You eradicate it. Mm -hmm. Someone is going to get hurt. Yes. And this little shit gibbon doesn't give a damn. And he'll come out and say violence is not the answer while he's been stoking the fires of it for decades. So. <sighs> The prime minister has literally killed 42,000 people and doesn't care is not something you want people taking to heart because mm -hmm. someone might want to do something about that. Yeah. The constant bad faith. It's like, at what point do these statements get considered defamation? Mm-hmm. Well, he did not say that in the House of Commons, so that's not parliamentary privilege. It doesn't apply there. This was tweeted. This was tweeted. This was something he tweeted on Friday at 7.13 p.m. Um, that, that's defamation for sure. That's a libel. That's libel. That's libelous. Come on. And, and the responses to that tweet are, are like, wow. Wow. <laughs> shredding him oh, just oh my god so this guy not everything in the world can be the fault of one man no I mean, are, do we really believe, do we really, really believe that Justin Trudeau wants to destroy a man who has been in power eight full years? Mm -hmm. By now, if he wanted to destroy the economy, if he wanted to curb your freedom of expression, if he wanted to take away all of your hunting rifles, if he wanted the press to say, only the liberal propaganda. Do you think life in Canada would be like this? Uh, he, mm. He's had eight years to do all the things that the conservatives it, say that he's planning him, to yeah. do to take all your rights away and make you his servant. He hasn't even tried. 
It's after eight years, if he hasn't done it, I don't think it's going to be happening. He had a majority. He ran on changing the way we freaking count the votes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he could have just set himself up for life right there. Well, uh, somebody I, I follow online, Guy Felicia, Felicella, Guy Felicella, sorry, had this to say. BC's response to the toxic drug crisis has been in the news a lot lately. The Conservative Party of Canada seems especially distressed about it and has been using a lot of snappy slogans about how common sense conservatives will fix the crisis by canceling health services that are currently saving lives. So, it was truly great to see the federal all-party standing committee on health come to Vancouver this week to gather facts. They spoke to public health, visited Road to Recovery at St. Paul's, and learned about overdose prevention and supportive housing and community courts in the DTES. I don't know what the DTES, downtown east side, I guess, of Vancouver. Yes. One notable gap, it was not all parties. There was not a single conservative committee member in attendance for any of these meetings or tours. But wait, I thought common sense conservatives want to solve the drug crisis and bring our loved ones home drug-free. Wouldn't it make sense to show up and learn about causes, impacts, efforts, and recovery programs related to the toxic drug crisis? Or could it be that all these snappy slogans are part of a political gambit and conservatives don't care about the drug crisis as much as they say they do? Or at all? Sure seems like it. Especially since it turns out Polyev was in Vancouver yesterday for a photo op presser where he announced that if elected, he'll prevent illegal drug use in hospitals. An announcement that was entirely pointless since illegal drug use is no longer permitted in BC hospitals as of May 7th when changes to the decriminalization pilot were approved by Health Canada. He should have joined the HESA tour. It would have made his manufactured concern a lot more believable. Like... This rhetoric is dangerous. It is. It is. Oh, God. Just fuck. And then the other thing PP did, which is uh, really interesting, is that uh, he called because the carbon tax wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. He called on the federal government to provide a gas tax reprieve for the summer. Mm. Didn't a whole bunch of provincial governments just raise their provincial gas tax? Yes, they did. But the federal government is the one he's asking to. Not his seven conservative premiers across the country, the federal government. So he wants to axe the carbon tax and he wants to axe the federal gas tax for the summer. Um, uh, but part of the federal gas tax goes to help fund things for municipalities where we apparently we want housing and we need to put in infrastructure like sewers and whatnot for housing, but mm -hmm. we're going to cut the source of funding over the summer for it. But he wants to build those homes by those subway stations and mass transit stuff that he will mm -hmm. not collect. He wants a reprieve from the federal government collecting money to fund. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And the context of him on May 16th mm -hmm. going out and saying, hey, in addition to cutting the carbon tax, why not cut the gas tax over the summer is... Fort McMurray, Cranberry Portage, Fort St. John, and Fort Nelson. As people are evacuated and whatnot, let's cut more gas taxes too so we can burn more of it while the country's literally on fire. This guy. Say it with me, Mr. Grizzly. Exasperated. All the damn time. All the damn time. Yeah. I just... Yeah. I'm just... 
Could you not be advocating policies that encourage people to burn more GHGs Uh, as the country is burning? Please, at least. Yeah, I got to tap out. Even more gas. I'm just. I got to tap out. I'm done. I'm. I'm done. I'm. Yeah. Just no. No, I can't. I can't anymore. I can't. I can't. I just. I'm. Yeah. No. No, I can't. I, I just can't. I can't even. I'm incapable. I'm. I'm. In, I'm incapable of even right now. Put a fiddle in his hands. Jesus Christ! Oh my. <sighs> just I. I... I... Yes. Yeah, it's, it's... Uh, Jillian, not caring can be a trauma response or just sociopathic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And of course, well, it's fire season, so we got a whole bunch of people talking about ours. Yeah. Well, he accused the liberal government of setting fires in yes. Northern Alberta. Yeah. Now, now, according to Wildfire Services, the over the the majority of the fires have been set as a result or started as a result of human activity. That does not mean arson. No, no, no. <laughs> human activity. You started not... a campfire and you didn't put it out right. Yeah. You, you did. It's... Doesn't mean you set it on purpose that burned the forest down intentionally. I mean, it's like... You're right about this, though, Saucy. They want to exasperate us into complacency. You are correct. I think that is their end goal. So that we just don't give a shit and we don't come out to vote. Like what haven't happened in the province of Ontario to give Doug Ford a landslide majority with 13% of the vote. 13. 13% gave him a majority because only 43% of the population bothered to show up. Hmm. Indeed. Uh, Kit Cassie says that it's time for another WAP break. Oh, yes, I agree. Here it is. Thank you. Ah. Uh, how can you love this guy? Cleanser, right? That's a palate cleanser. How can you not love this guy? Seriously. Love this guy. Uh, okay. Um, we have some thing that makes me happy because you know that I like when people um, explain things well. Mm-hmm. And Prime Minister has a knack of being able to do that um, because, well. Oh, yes, this clip. Yeah, I had this from last week, and we didn't have a chance to air it. Yeah, we didn't have it yet. Now, before we do that, I want you to show um, this tweet uh, from, this is a, um, this guy. I don't know if this guy's a real person. I would assume Mm. he is, maybe because he doesn't have a blue check mark. Um. Mm-hmm. But it's this account is a constant stream of really just oddly stated mm-hmm. stuff, like this one, for example. Uh, oh, did you post it? Yeah. Is it, is it it's there? Up there? I don't see it. Hang on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I got it now. Okay. What'd you read it, Mr. Grizzly? Malcolm Twizzle at MDT546. Trudeau has never explained to me how increasing the capital gains tax on the cottages of the parents and grandparents of Gen X and millennials millennials is going to contribute to generational fairness. Anyone? Okay. Malcolm. Darling. I'm not, don't know if you expected him to pay you a visit and knock on your door and take time out of his schedule to actually go and explain it to you personally. Um, but the way the world works is uh, if you happen, if the prime minister happens to say something 
when you happen to not be at your monitor, mm -hmm. does it mean the prime minister didn't say it? It's like, if you happen to miss class that day, don't complain that the teacher didn't cover the course material. Yeah. Mr. Grizzly, if you please. <laughs> This is a tax policy change that impacts less than 1% of people, but look at how much attention it's getting. Some people don't think that the richest few should pay more in taxes. Well, I don't agree with that. At a time when the richest are only getting richer, I think it's fair to ask those people to pay a little more. You may have heard of the capital gains tax, or what some people call the capital gains tax advantage. Now, if you don't know what that is, you probably don't get that advantage. It's basically where you've made enough money and amassed enough wealth in assets that you end up getting a tax break. Here's what I mean. Everybody pays taxes on 100% of their salary. If a nurse is making $70,000 a year or an investment banker has a salary of $800,000 a year, when it comes to paying income taxes, they're both paying taxes on all of that income. Now, that nurse may be living a good life, but she's probably not earning enough to be buying and selling assets like properties. But that investment banker, who's making $800,000 a year, probably is. He's putting some of his money in assets, like buying and selling properties or shares in companies. This becomes like a second and sometimes bigger source of income for him. When that investment banker sells those assets, he only pays taxes on 50% of the profits he makes. Now, he's not paying 50% in taxes. It means that if he makes a million dollars from selling properties or stocks, taxes only apply to half a million dollars worth of it. So when all the math is done, that nurse is paying about 29% in taxes on her full $70,000 salary. But the investment banker, he's only paying taxes on half of the money he makes from selling assets. That's the capital gains tax advantage. And it's not really fair. So we're going to change that. Starting June 25th, if someone makes up to $250,000 in capital gains, they're still going to pay taxes on only half of that. But for anything they make over $250,000, they're going to pay a little more. They'll pay taxes on two-thirds of that. So the very richest people are going to profit a little less off their assets. Only 0.13% of Canadians, to be exact. These are people who have an average income of $1.4 million a year and are mostly in their 60s or older. So why am I telling you this if the vast majority of you won't pay a dollar more? Well, for two reasons. First, the conversation always seems to be dominated by the richest people in a society. This is a tax policy change that impacts less than 1% of people, but look at how much attention it's getting. And second, you should care about your tax system. This change to the capital gains tax will result in almost $20 billion in new revenue. Revenue that will go towards the biggest investment in housing in Canadian history. Revenue that will create a national school food program that will make prescription contraception and insulin available for anyone who needs it. That'll build a national dental care program. See, a fair system creates a fair country. And that's what I want. A fair Canada for every generation. Yeah, well. That, Class dismissed. Uh, yeah, spells it all out. Spells it all out. Now, interesting thing you didn't uh, you might have noticed uh, when they were showing what the taxation rate for that nurse that was making seventy thousand dollars and what the the banker mm -hmm. would make based on those capital gains, um, the taxation rate for the investment banker was still lower. Yes, overall, by about three percent or something, mm -hmm. but was still lower. Um, you will notice also the zero when he talks about the zero point three percent because he's speaking specifically here on the passive income because yes we do know that there are situations where somebody may get a one-time asset disposal that mm -hmm. may fall under there and get a ding a little much but when he was talking about when you showed that showed that graph and he was talking about a second source of income he's talking about passive income that is 
this is just my personal opinion, but in my personal opinion, I would like to see more taxes on passive income and less taxes on employment income. Mm-hmm. Stuff you actually had to work for. Now, people go, oh, you don't think you had to work? The investments make themselves. Yeah, you have to make a good decision about where you invest all that kind of stuff. Yes, you have to monitor your account and stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, you set it and you forget it. Yes. You're not going in nine to five. No. Right? Like It's passive income. The people that make enough money to have enough in passive income, specifically not a one-time disposal of an asset or not, but passive income, that's the 0.13%. They get that money every year. Mm -hmm. Every year. He explained it. He explained it. He made a video. He explained it all to us. So yes, Malcolm, he did explain it to you. He must have been at the bathroom. Missed it. But that's another one of these moves. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it when it happened, so he never did it. It's like the... Uh, it's like reverse object permanence or something. I think so, yeah. It's like I close my eyes. Oh, my God, the country disappeared. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like he never said it. Yes. Well, I wasn't there. Yeah. But it doesn't mean things happen when you're not there. <laughs> like a lot happens when you're not there. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. All right. A uh, little, yep. Mr. Grizzly, uh, we definitely do have a show. So uh, Mr. Grizzly sent me a little message on the chat there. <laughs> I was just about to ask if we, we had a show, and we do. Uh, last little thing I want to mention is that uh, tomorrow, uh, inflation data will be coming. Uh, there seems to be an expectation uh, from economists uh, that it will go down a little. Uh, most of them are saying 0.1%, uh, uh, which would bring it back to where it was the month before last because we had gone down to 2.8, went up to 2.9. I think that's the core number. And now they're expecting another 2.8. Some are even expecting a 2.7. Um, so we'll see. Uh, people are hoping, a lot of people are hoping that that will lead to to uh, a June 5th announcement from the Bank of Canada of a cut in interest rates. Um, it seems that according to um, an analysts that they deem the chances that it will happen in June are 40% and that it would probably be more likely in July. But there is a lot of pressure from the community saying, please don't wait. It's like, you can really harm the recovery because if you wait too long before cutting them down because as you know like this we are in a situation with mortgage renewals and whatnot where there's going to be inflation and things like you know housing and lodging still yet to come right so the, with that baked in you know it could be a good idea to start cutting rates a little bit in that sense rather than waiting too long um so we'll see what happens with that. It is also expected that uh, because you have the core number and then you have the number that with the, the volatile elements stripped out, mm -hmm. uh, it's also expected because uh, that one went down last month, uh, whereas the core inflation uh, went up because gas had gone up about four or four point five percent in that month. Um, so, but it seems that the 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 expectation is that the core number minus the volatile elements will also uh, be lower. And uh, if that comes with a, a drop in the gas price, which I suspect might be there, because, I, I mean, I don't drive, but I've heard a lot of people comment about how gas prices have come down over the past few weeks, um, more than the carbon tax increase, by the way. Um, so <laughs> after the, 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 the spike, after the, the switch over to summer driving gas. So... Um, We'll see what it is. Uh, I am personally hoping for a June cut because. <laughs> yeah. Personal I, vested I, interest, I understand. Uh, personal vested interest. My, uh, it's like, listen, the cost of my mortgage has gone up 
the inflation on my mortgage payment has been over 50% since the, <laughs> since the things went up. So uh, a nice little cut uh, would, would, would do me good. Uh, the, we're still on, uh, on, on um, a course for two to three cuts over the course of this calendar year. I don't suspect any one of the cuts will be more than 25 basis points. So probably 0.75 over the course of the year, three quarters of a point. And when added to the uh, quarter of a point we already have ahead of the United States would make about 1%, which is about the maximum that we can go. But if the United States cuts some rates in November, well, then, then that, that opens the door for us to be able to have a couple more rate cuts in the following year and still maintain that 1% or, or less a spread. So um, maybe a little bit of relief coming to your pocketbooks as a result of interest rate uh, decreases. And uh, do note that if that happens for the federal government and for provincial governments, uh, that means lower costs for servicing loans. So if the interest rates do go down, don't be surprised uh, come uh, when they start uh, the fall economic statement and uh, later on next budget where they say, oh my God, we did so much better than we had expected. Mm -hmm. Because, well, that will be cost savings on interest primarily, not necessarily fantastic economic management. So just be prepared for it because you will get the, you will get the line. <laughs> All right, kits and cups. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. If you do not want to miss an episode, you do not have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl, she has sponsored our pod page. You go to podpage.com slash true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you click subscribe there, when we have something fresh off the bed with, it comes directly to you. And that way you don't have to miss an episode. If you would like to support us in other ways, hey, we've got merch. Yes, we some. do. Yes. Bring a little extra beaver into your life by going to the True North Eager Beaver merch store on Etsy, which I believe is etsy.com slash CA slash shop slash TNEB merch store, mm -hmm. if I remember it correctly off the yes. top of my brain. So that is correct. Go there. Yes. That is correct. <clears throat> Still got it. <laughs> even though I'm getting older <laughs> the brains the old brains working so mm -hmm. there uh, if you want to get some merch thank you very much uh, I, I looked at uh, the the shop the other day and it said that three people have indeed uh, bought merch so far from us so thank you those who did thank you so much we really appreciate it um if you would like to make sure that you help us become profitable we need to get to a thousand subscribers on our youtube channel so if you would like to help us with that you need to make like kit elaine who says have a beyond awesome day everyone and remember to smash the button before you leave and that's on our youtube page true north eager beaver media if you go there uh i think the the qr code that just appeared under my my chin is for the pod page right yes yes Okay, just didn't want people to be confused because I'm talking about the YouTube site there when that appeared. Mm. So if you go to the YouTube page Which and then click on be. like, share, right and there. subscribe, the QR There's code by Mr. Grizzly's head right there, if you scan that, that would be really, really, really good. We would appreciate that uh, because when we get to a thousand, then YouTube starts paying us a certain amount of dollars for uh, every thousand views. And that... Uh, Getting paid to do well, passive income. Getting paid to just mm -hmm. exist uh, does help. <laughs> it's not. Like, it's not going to cover any bills anytime soon. I can tell yes. you that. Yep. Yep. But every drop, every drop helps. So uh, if you can uh, get your friends and uh, your friends and family and all of that to click subscribe and help us out, we would be most grateful. Thank you very much. And if you would like to help us out in other ways, kits and cubs, please go to the emergency hydration fund otherwise known as our tip jar, at our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. The QR code that just appeared by Mr. Grizzly's head will bring you there. And uh, like I said, that's where our tip jar is. If you enjoy our product, if you would like us uh, to be able to do more and uh, do more things, you know, live remotes, that type of stuff, you know, We've been talking about trying to get out and uh, do some live events where people can come and see us, 
that does require some money. So if you would like to those things to happen uh, to uh, help with upfront costs for that, then please do uh, drop a few coins in there if you have it. And if you can't, that's quite all right, because the most important thing to us is the gift of your attention. And, your and when you participate, yes. your time. Yes, you got, there are lots of podcasts out there. Lots, lots of podcasts. <laughs> lots of pod, it's the bestest is podcasts in all of the podcast thing. <laughs> so I, 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 <laughs> it's just sciences. <laughs> so if you would like to. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes. <laughs> I lost work. I was yeah, you're right. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Support us. There you go. Short. <laughs> if you would like to write us, true.eagerbeaver at gmail.com. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, uh, stars and reviews are very appreciated. We uh, love to hear from you. So if you uh, comment on our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver, our Twitter feed at True Eager, or uh, on our YouTube page in the comment section, we do try to read everything. So uh, thank you so very much uh, for all your participation. It means the world to us. All right. From the uh, because democracy is something that you do get involved in the NDP leadership race in Alberta. It's uh, the most competitive one there's been ever. So uh, mm -hmm. involved, and uh, uh, according to the polling, uh, new polling that's come out, uh, things are really tightening in BC for the provincial election. It is no longer a foregone conclusion. It seems that the right has been united. So if you look at uh, the poll from the the BC. Uh, conservative party or something like that it's like going right up like a hockey stick and now there's just like mere points difference between the ndp and uh, the united conservative front there so uh and uh when you've got pierre making all that uh noise about uh the drug stuff and given that uh, bc is you know uh ground zero for that uh it looks like that that might become an issue there so uh you need to get involved if you want to make sure that uh, your province remains progressive because a couple of months ago, it looked like you didn't, wouldn't have to do much except for just show up and vote, but now it's looking a whole lot tighter. Um, and uh, a side note on that, uh, in Ontario, uh, it seems that the federal government will not be approving the city of Toronto's request uh, for similar measures. Uh, Doug Ford made a big stink about it, saying, hey, we really shouldn't do that. And, well, the federal government said, well, you know, cities are the creations of the provinces, so if the provinces don't want it, well, we're not going to do it. So the prime minister, again, showing... It's like, it came from BC, they asked, we did. From Ontario, Toronto wants it, but the government of Ontario said no, so we're not. Such a tyrant. Mm. Such an unreasonable tyrant. Yes. So, right. All right. From the Beaver Lodge. This is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. It's a holiday. So please, if you are off, if you're not one of the pe few people today who are working still to make sure that, uh, well, the country keeps running. Thank you, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, have a wonderful holiday. Do something nice for yourself. Right? I'm going to go take a nap immediately. Yes. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? If you're tired, get some rest. I'm about to do so. All right. Kids and cubs, have a... Beaver River for holiday, Mr. Grizzly, please cue the cock. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. <laughs>